It was the biggest Saturday of college basketball this season. The stars were out and they did not disappoint. One team of Wildcats is going in the right direction. What up, Arizona? Some other Wildcats? Not so much. I'm looking at you, Kentucky. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to thank you for joining us today. The episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs, which helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Folks, it was a crazy, bonkers, wild Saturday. So many high-level elite college basketball games. I've literally just walked in the door from getting home from the airport, flying home from New York City, where the CBS Sports Classic took place at Madison Square Garden. Of course, got to got home from the airport, and, or got to the airport. My car was dead, dead battery, had to call AAA. It's a whole thing, but I'm here with you. I'm here for you because you're here with me and you're here for me. So let's dive in and let's do it. Here's why this Saturday was so awesome and why I think it's so important for the sport of college basketball. You had a top five matchup, number five, Houston, at number two, Virginia, a top 10 matchup, number six, Tennessee, at number nine, Arizona, Two top 15 matchups, 15 Gonzaga versus number four Alabama in Birmingham and 14 Indiana at number eight Kansas. What does all that mean? Of the top 15 teams in the land, eight of them were playing each other on Saturday. If we stretched it out to the top 16, that would also include UCLA and Kentucky. So that means that 10 of the top 16 teams were all interplaying each other. This is so good for the game of college basketball to have eight of the top 15 playing, 10 of the top 16 playing. And it's not just like I know with UCLA and Kentucky, for example, it's because they're in the CBS Sports Classic. But the rest of these mo- is mostly just because they scheduled each other. That That's what has to be happening. Most coaches are unafraid or are afraid or are unwilling to schedule these games. To those of you out there who are and scheduling these and who will schedule them, thank you. You're doing stuff to raise the profile of our sport, and it's so good. This is why we continue to say that we need a college basketball king to to rule things and to help set scheduling and and create great matchups. Even more important about these is that uh, several of them were at true like home road environments rather than at a neutral environment. You heard me very specifically say Houston at Virginia. That was at John Paul Jones Arena, right? Tennessee at Arizona, Indiana at Kansas, at Fog Allen Fieldhouse, right? All of these on-campus matchups. It's so, so stinking good, and we have to keep doing it. We have to keep pushing for these high-level non-conference games. And almost just as importantly, they're all actually beating each other, right? It's not just like there's there's one dominant team. So many strong teams. Bama beat Houston last weekend. Houston turn around, turns around and beats Virginia, ending their unbeaten season. Then Bama goes out and loses to Gonzaga. Like, it, it's just so good. So I just want to quickly touch on a couple of these high-level games that we're looking at. So it's like our first round of quick hitters. We'll have another one later in the show as well, our usual weekly quick hitters. But I I do want to touch on these high-level top 15, top 16 type games. We'll start with the top five matchup. Number five, Houston wins at Virginia. This win is going to be worth gold on Selection Sunday for the Houston Cougars, especially because playing in the AAC, they just don't have a lot of high-level opportunities left after the non-conference schedule. So to pick up this win, especially after the loss to Alabama last week, is so big. 69-61. Honestly, I thought this game would be like first team to 50 wins because they're such dynamic defensive teams. And so I love to see that it actually got into the 60s. Here's the thing, though. 
both of these teams are very, very worthy of top five consideration. Not just second weekend teams, but like legit national title contenders. I would say Houston slightly, ever so slightly more so than Virginia. But to me, both of them are final four um, capable teams. But also keep in mind, every time a basketball game is played, someone has to lose. So even in a matchup of two top five teams, one of them's going to lose. Don't read into that too much. That's just part of the game. But again, I would put Virginia just a tier below the Houstons of the world. For the Cougars, all five starters are in double digits, led by Jairus Walker's 17 and 7. That's freshman, right? Um, also, he had four assists, a block, a steal, and just one turnover. Great stuff there. Unfortunately for Virginia, they fall from the ranks of the unbeatens. That brings us down to six, but there was another unbeaten that fell on Saturday. We'll get to that later in the show, but we're down to just five. Elsewhere, kind of the nightcap of this whole Saturday, Arizona holds off a very difficult Tennessee team at Arizona. Tennessee brought it on the road. They played tough. They made pushes. They kept shoving Arizona, and Arizona just kept shoving right back. That Arizona front court, Zoo Tabellis and Umar Balo, these dudes are so steady together. Might be the best front court in the nation, at, at the very least, top three, right? Tabellis goes for 19 and nine, Balo 18 and eight. I mean, if you're going to get, I mean, that's essentially. Uh, just shy of 40 and 20. If you're going to get that production from your starting front court on a, on a game by game basis, watch out folks. Um, what Arizona now has four quad one wins. Um, great, great stuff. Tommy Lloyd is doing what he needs to do and, and kind of similar to Houston, the PAC 12 is not great. And so outside of, you know, Oregon's down, but outside of UCLA, not much to work with there. So that's a big win to get. <laughs> On the Tennessee side of things, quite frankly, they have to shoot better from deep if they're going to be the team they want to be and reach their ceiling. They made just eight of 27 threes in this game. That's not going to cut it. Uh, down to Birmingham, Alabama, Gonzaga. I think a lot of folks are starting to ride off the Bulldogs. I, I know my co-host Andy Patton, he's, he's getting a little worried himself. Man, I love that they come into this game against Alabama, who's riding one of the highest in the country. I had them in my top five last week. Great stuff. But Gonzaga shows that they are still part of this upper echelon of teams, very top 15, maybe even top 10 worthy again, um, beating Alabama. That's proven they can clearly beat anyone in the country. And Gonzaga says, hang on. Don't hold up. Don't hang up that phone just quite yet. We're right there as well. On the Alabama side of things, holy Brandon Miller. This freshman is insane. If you have not watched Alabama play and seen freshman Brandon Miller, you are in for a treat. 36 points in this game. 12 of, like, it's not like he's taken 83 shots to get there. 12 of 22 from the field, 6 of 11 from three, 6 of 6 from the free throw line. The one blemish for him, six turnovers. Got to clean that up, but we'll take everything else. Um, Drew Timmy though, woof, 29 and 10 leads six different Bulldogs who are in double digits. Great stuff there. As to the CBS sports classic, we'll talk about the thrilling UNC win over Ohio state in just a bit. I want to go to the nightcap of it first, less so because of the UCLA side of things. We're going to talk about UCLA a whole bunch in our next segment, but the Kentucky side of things, this is bad for Kentucky. Um, I'm I'm officially concerned now. I've been saying they're one of the teams I think could be a a Final Four team. Boy, uh, the people that I anticipated taking strides that they would take, for example, top Jacob Toppin, like just not not doing what I expected him to do. That having Severe Wheeler as a non shooting guard is is severely limiting. Ah. Uh, they got some stuff to figure out. Now, it's only the third loss of the season. You, you get into SEC play, you can figure stuff out. But I I am not convinced right now that John Calipari's team is who I thought they were. Kentucky fans, if you're here, tell me why I'm wrong. I, I need to know what I'm missing with the Wildcats right now. Uh, as for the UCLA side of things, 
maybe the Pac-12 isn't Arizona and everyone else after all. Maybe we do have an upper tier. Are, am I right? Do we have that? Both UCLA and Arizona folks, let me know if you're listening in. Well, I may be concerned about the Kentucky Wildcats, but I'm thinking I may be too low on the team they just lost to, the UCLA Bruins, who we just talked about right here. I want to learn more about them in just a minute, and I hope you are ready for that too. But first, this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you got to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. It's incredibly easy to create a free job post, so why not give it a try? Add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can discern who you'd like to interview and ultimately hire. You want to finish the year strong and the right new hire can help you do just that. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. Again, that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. Joined today on Locked on College Basketball by the host of UCLA Locked on, Zachary Anderson Yoxheimer, coming off a major win at Madison Square Garden over the Kentucky Wildcats. Listen, UCLA at this point is 10 and 2, wins notable wins previously at Stanford over Oregon, at Maryland last weekend, and now this marquee double digit win over the Wildcats in the world's most famous arena. UCLA's 10 and 2, understandable single digit losses to Illinois and to Baylor. And and it feels Zachary like man the Bruins are flying under the national radar a little bit, but for crying out loud, they're third at Ken Palm. When is the nation going to wake up and take notice of Mick Cronin and his crew? I mean, sometimes you see these overrated teams or these teams that get the preseason hype, right? UCLA basketball, they were top 10. They're getting the love. Right. You just didn't know what the freshmen would be like. They had the freshman post and a Dembona, Amari Bailey, which we'll get to, but you mix in the veterans with the freshmen. And when you lose two games in succession in early November, it takes you a little bit to climb back, especially when until this week against the Maryland and Kentucky games, they didn't really have a game other than maybe Oregon. But, you know, Oregon (laughs) stumbled early. That's not going to be a resume builder until you got these two road neutral site wins, which should open up some eyes that, hey, the Bruins are good. And, hey, it even proved to me these Bruins are for real. And they figured some things out since that early November loss back to back. Well, you love to see it. So what what are these things they figured out? How on earth did they get this double-digit victory over Kentucky? I mean, the big thing is, one, Kentucky is very a solid rebounding team. They kept Oscar Shibway to under 10 points. Wow. And I know he is coming back from he is coming back from injury, but he's had some time to build up. But the Bruins threw three different guys at him defensively and said, Hey, you guys got five fouls. They have Mac Etienne coming off injury. You had a Dembona, who's supposed to be an elite post player. Hasn't exactly shown that yet offensively, except the Maryland game a little bit. And then they also had, uh, it's blanking off the top of my head, Kenneth Nuba. Three guys at this threw up and said, go get him, stop him, stop him. And while Sheboy was four of 12, four of Kentucky's five starters held under double figures. Mostly the Bruins are defense, rebounding, and shoot well. Not that they can shoot the three ball well, but they just play solid basketball for Mick Cronin's bunch. And it's just easy basketball to watch sometimes, although this Saturday was a very defensive grind fest. Yes, absolutely. It was. Well, listen, in, in this game on Saturday, both Jalen Clark and Tyler Campbell in double figures of 15, but led by Jaime Jaquez's 19. I think a lot of people assumed, listen, Johnny Juzang is gone. We lose one JJ and the other really has to step up. How has Jaquez been able to kind of step into Johnny Juzang's shoes this season? Well, first things first, he, he was banged up. He had a bad ankle the whole year last year. Most thing had the cleanup surgery. He's feeling good. So a healthy Jaime Hawkins Jr., I believe, yeah, I don't know if you saw the reports, there's reports of him going to the, the pickup courts against the pros and knock and take it down the Clippers. Should yeah. I knock it down? I'm wearing the Laker jersey, right? <laughs> knock down the Clippers. 
<laughs> it's all fun and games, though, because he's worked on his game. He knows what this is. This is a building year for him to either vault up a potential NBA draft per st- gra- draft pregame stock, whatever it is. Words <laughs> coming out of the mouth. So he basically, he's preparing to go pro, and this is his last year to prove I'm healthy. I've added to my game, and it's just got an easy footwork about him, right? He's like the mid-range, more guard-oriented version of Drew Timmy. Think about it. Mm. Timmy down low's got that good post play, that footwork. That's what Hawkes has, except he's got more of a jump shot. He's more of a guard than Timmy is. If you look at their footwork really closely, you can see, all right, this guy's really good. He's healthy, which is most important. And he's got that mid-range jumper that's kind of gone away, but maybe coming back in basketball. Yeah, love that. As for Tiger Campbell, it really seems... Like the Bruins are at their best when he is able to be more of, of a playmaker distributor than rather than when he's forced to be uh, looked at for more scoring as he has been sometimes this year. What, how does he go about striking that balance of when to call his own number versus when to get other guys involved? Just seems like such a cerebral guard. Well, how, how does Tiger Campbell balance that well? Well, the big thing is you've mentioned Johnny Juzang's gone. UCLA lost a key contributor, Jules Bernard. And while Cody Riley was a post player, that's a lot of key guys that got some points for the Bruins in their final four run and their sweet 16 run in back-to-back years. And Mick Cronin's been on record saying, I want Tiger Campbell to score. Hmm. I want him to get a more aggressive role in scoring. I, I did an episode recently, Isaac, where I mentioned his shooting numbers aren't as good as they were the last two years. Interesting. His three-point numbers, his field goal percentage actually grew until this year, which they've fallen off to what was his true freshman-level numbers, under 40% from the field, mediocre three-point numbers, but they've fallen off mostly because he's got to take more shots, averaging four more shots per game. And while he is a good distributor, it's what Mick Cronin's asking him, hey, we need someone to fill in those points per game and if the freshmen like Amari Bailey, Adem Bona, if maybe Singleton, all these different guys that UCLA has, if they're not getting it, Tiger Campbell has the ability to go the lane. He can shoot. But it is a fine line when your coach is asking you, hey, stop <laughs> being a distributor as much. We want you to score. Yes. And when it comes down to it in the tournament, he's going to need to score a big bucket. Maybe not put in 30, but he's going to need to score a big bucket in a moment where he needs to shine individually. That's right. Guard play is where it's at in March. And we all know, obviously, Mick Cronin – uh, once he's a defensive coach and he wants his teams to defend and play at a high level on that. And as you just alluded to, and we've talked about a little bit already, uh, probably the highest heralded freshman coming in this season is Amari Bailey. Maybe one of the things that, that UCLA could get is a little bit more consistent performance from him that would take some of that scoring load off of Tiger Campbell. I know he had a good start to the season, had several double-digit games and, and a streak uh, a couple weeks ago where he had four straight double-digit games, but has tapered off the last three games or so. How, how can Amari Bailey really, as we get into conference play here, I know it's UC Davis and then Pac-12 play the rest of the year. Um, what can he do getting into conference play to really settle in and be a consistent offensive contributor? I mean, the biggest thing is for Bailey, I, in my personal opinion, this might be controversial. I'm not sure he's ready to go to the NBA. I mean, he can no. obviously go and score, but if you want to be a lottery guy and go get buckets and be immediately on a team that gets lots of money and lots of points, he's <laughs> not at that level. I like his athletic ability. He's got that slash. He's got that left-handed thing, you know, you know, the lefty. He's got things going for him, but you can see sometimes in the games things don't click as much. And, like, he does good roles, like against Maryland. It wasn't a scoring role, but he, he had a good game against Maryland, just didn't necessarily shoot the ball well. And Kentucky, well, that's a different wake-up call in a different mindset yeah. when you're playing yeah. Kentucky. But Mick Cronin came out after their two losses in November and yelled at them, mostly calling out freshmen and the veterans. And then Amari Bailey all of a sudden played better. And while the one thing is, is his jump shot good? In key moments the last couple of games, he hasn't hit that jumper. So I'm not sure if that's NBA ready. Of course, while the three-point line's gone deeper and deeper in the college game, it's not the NBA level, but still it's pretty close. He can just find a way to weave himself in all facets of the game and maybe during Pac-12 play against those weaker opponents, get that jumper going and find that NBA level jumper that needs to expand his game to make him pro ready if he's as he's expected to probably leave after a year. So big thing, as I'm saying, Isaac, 
just get that jumper ready and find ways to get into games and get easy buckets. It's always that weird balance of you want him to get there so that this team can really produce the fight and John Wooden's maybe making another final four run. But then it's also like, wait, don't get too good because then you're going to leave and we'd love to have you back next year. So we'll have to track that progression. As we said, we do get into Pac-12 play here pretty quickly. And for most people, it seems like at this point in the season, it's Arizona and UCLA top tier. And then the rest of the Pac-12 down beneath that, especially as you already alluded to earlier, that Oregon just ain't it this year mm-hmm. what everyone expected. Uh, what what can we look forward to from UCLA as we get into Pac-12 play to both um, do what they need to do against weaker opponents, but also not just hang with, but maybe move past Arizona? I mean, arguably, you could say after UCLA's week, they're, they're past Arizona, right? I mean... Arizona, of course, got the big win. UCLA got two big wins. We're all going to be circling those days. They're not at the top of my head right now when they play Arizona, but those are coming. But for UCLA, they've got so many key matchups. I've actually, because I do some radio play-by-play in Division I college right. basketball, I've seen right. two of the Pac-12 teams, not the better ones. I saw Stanford, <laughs> and I've seen Washington, and they're all right. But then, heck, even the bottom of the Pac-12, right? Colorado, what has they done? They went off and knocked off Tennessee, right? They've got teams in the Pac-12 that have, very weird losses and then very good wins. And at any point in any night, UCLA, if they're not going to score, sometimes 63 might not cut it on the road. Like last year, they went to Arizona State, who was not good at the time. I believe at the end of the year, they went on a run. But the Bruins lost to Arizona a week after beating them last year and lost in triple overtime to ASU. So you can't ever count anybody out in the Pac-12. Right. And with the Bruins, you can see Amari Bailey struggling. You have guys who, you know, Tiger Campbell's not shooting the ball well. There will be nights on the road, especially where the Bruins can struggle, but it is a one, two. And if the Bruins lose more than three games in the Pac-12, then something's gone wrong, right? If they lose more than two, arguably, that's not a good look because they have played themselves into a one or two seed line, potentially going forward, being favored in every game, but arguably one or two against Arizona. So for UCLA, this is a chance to go on a run and earn that one seed in the West, two seed in the West and avoid some tough, or whatever it is, wherever they have to be sure, seeding sure. in that region, they get themselves put into a good, balanced line heading to the tournament. Love it. Mick Cronin will take this team anywhere. Bring all comers. By the way, those two games versus Arizona, January 21st in Arizona, and then wrapping up the regular season on oh, yeah. Saturday, March 4th at UCLA, Boy, howdy, what an end to the regular season in the Pac-12. Zachary Anderson, Yaksheimer, thank you so much. Folks, make sure that you check out Locked on UCLA anywhere you get podcasts. Well, it is coming up time for our Monday tradition of quick hitters looking around the nation at games we haven't touched on yet. That is coming up in just a second. But first, this episode is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline is your number one source for sports betting info, stats, news, and analysis. Get the latest odds and trends for every professional and amateur league out there, from pro football to college bowl season to basketball to the World Cup, which wrapped up on Sunday in incredible fashion. Man, they've got it all at BetOnline. Make sure you check out the line for Tuesday night's top 25 matchup between Virginia and Miami, a great ACC tilt. It's always the fastest and easiest way to get your sports betting fix at BetOnline. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about all the trends in action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Okie dokie, it's time for our favorite weekly segment, Quick Hitters. I'm going to keep it short and sweet today because Andy's not here with me to bounce back and forth, and that's half the fun. So I'm just going to give you four more games you should be aware of. Number one, we touched on the nightcap of the CBS Sports Classic. Oh boy, the kickoff to this was insane. North Carolina pulls out an 89-84 overtime victory over Ohio State, who had a 14-point first half lead. The Tar Heels have to get a shot, turnaround shot from Pete Nance at the buzzer of regulation to force overtime, right after Ohio State had scored a go-ahead um like kind of floater in the lane from Bryce Sensabaugh with two seconds left. Uh, Hubert Davis had two timeouts left, was able to utilize those to one, get the ball to mid court 
to R- uh, Leaky Black to RJ Davis. Assistant coach Jeff Lebo draws up a play he had seen Penn State use earlier this year. Carolina has never run it, practiced it, seen it, nothing. Coach Lebo's like, hey, let's try this. And it works to perfection, and they pull out a victory in overtime. Wacky stuff in Madison Square Garden, but you love to see it on the biggest national stage. Second quick hitter, number three, UConn, stays dominant. They go to Butler for part of Big East play and dominate the Bulldogs 68-46. to They continue to do it. Adama Sinogo leads the team again. Just great stuff for the Huskies. Meanwhile, number one, Purdue gets by Davidson 69-61. That's why I've still got UConn number one. They're going to be number two in the AP poll. When it refreshes after Virginia's loss, they'll drop, and UConn will slide the number two. But uh, just a little foreshadowing, I've got that order flipped still. Uh, Number three on our quick hitters bounce around. UNLV, unfortunately, is the other team that falls from the unbeaten ranks. But listen to how painful this was. The the game, they, they played San Francisco. They lose 75 to 73. All right, here you go. The running Rebels lead 73 to 64 with three minutes left, and they did not score a single point the rest of the ray. That's right. The Dons closed this game on an 11-0 run. But here's here's part of the pain for UNLV. They still had the lead with 10 seconds left in the game, 73-72. But San Francisco makes a three with six seconds left in the game. And then UNLV still gets a shot, uh, essentially right at the buzzer for the win. They take a three, um, falls, misses. San Francisco knocks UNLV from the unbeatens. That means game over, undefeated season gone, and we've got five left. Who are they? I'm going to give you three seconds to see if you can pause it or come up with them yourself. One, two, three. All right. Hopefully you got them. See if you did. UConn, Purdue, Mississippi State, still there, New Mexico, and Utah State. Keep it going, Utah State. I love that so much. Fourth game on our quick hitters run around, Creighton. Woof. These poor Blue Jays. They started the season ranked preseason top 10. They started off 6-0. Love it. Great start. They have lost their last six games. They're now 6-6 six and six this season. They lost this weekend, opening up Big East play on the road at Marquette. I believe that was a Friday tip. Oof. Coach McDermott, you got to get stuff turned around, brother. Okay, let's wrap up today's show with my top five. Obviously, Andy's not here to tell me why I'm wrong like he normally is. And uh, unfortunately, I don't get to unpack his. Let me remind you of where I had teams last week. UConn 1, Purdue 2, Houston 3, Texas 4, and Virginia 5. And then just on the cusp, I had Tennessee, Bama, Kansas, and Arizona. This week, my top five, the top three honestly remains unchanged. UConn and Purdue still undefeated. Neither uh, UConn or Purdue has shown me anything to think they should be flipped around. I know, as I said, it's going to be different in the AP poll, but I think UConn won, Purdue two, and then Houston. I already had them three even after their loss last week to Alabama, but them getting back up off the mat and getting this win this weekend. Love it. Keep them right there at number three. So it's four and five where I have some movement. It's I had Texas at four. They are out. I still believe in what Texas has, but man, given all this Chris Beard stuff, I cannot trust them because Chris Beard, like everything that's happened this week aside is a great basketball coach in terms of X's and O's and on court stuff. And so I need to see what Texas is going to be before I can keep them in my top five. And then as for Virginia, I think um, for me, they were top five, just more based on virtue of being undefeated. They're going to be a great team. I think they will be top 10, top 15 all season long. I don't doubt that, but top five right now, they're going to have to prove that over and over again. And I don't know if the ACC has enough for them to do that by just beating up on Duke and North Carolina and, um, the also rans of the ACC. I mean, I know Miami is going to be okay and stuff like that, whatever. Anyway, they are both out and I'm bringing in at number four, the Arizona Wildcats. I am all in on this team. I think they are fantastic. 
and I can't wait to see what they continue to do. And number five, is it legitimately time to consider that the reigning national champions might just be able to do it again? Who it might be. Anyway, I've got Kansas at number five after they knocked off Indiana as part of one of these top 15 games that we talked about there in Fog Allen Fieldhouse. Our guy Grady Dick does it again. Another 20 point game. I love Grady Dick. He's so good. Right on the cusp for me under consideration, Virginia, UCLA coming up after that win over Kentucky. Texas right there still. Alabama, I don't want to drop them too far. I still believe in what they're doing. And the Zags sneaking back into my under top five consideration. Great stuff there. Ah, Folks, thanks so much for joining us for today's show. Make your second listen of the day, Locked On Sports Today podcast. Biggest stories of the day, plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and of course, the take of the day. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and anywhere else you get podcasts. Please make sure to subscribe, smash the like button, and comment. Great show. Can't wait to be back with you tomorrow. But until then, peace.